I'm delighted to be uh, here in uh, Pittsburgh. I think the last time I was here was in association with an event connected with the same names of folks that we are honoring tonight who are supporting uh, this uh, conference. At that time, it was Henderson Lectures. So um, it's great to be uh, great to be here. And uh, those of you who need to leave for for the game, uh, uh, y you know. <laughs> You do the smart thing. I understand. <laughs> there are just no, no, no problem uh, whatso whatsoever. <laughs> um, so the title of my talk is "Before Embrace," um, and you might say, "Well, what does a title like this um, was supposed to achieve in a conference about conflict?" Uh, embrace, I have come to think, and I've chosen this metaphor because it can stand as a metaphor of healed, uh, properly structured or properly lived relationships uh, between, between people. Um, I remember when I first introduced this metaphor, uh, uh, and I think it was first public lecture on it, I was in Sri Lanka, and there was a dispute between a German theologian and an African bishop about the appropriateness of the metaphor of embrace. German theologian thought that it was way too intimate. Handshake would be just fine. <laughs> And, and, and a burly, burly African bishop said, oh no, we need uh, an embrace, right? Cultures will differ on, on the sensibility on this, and I, at that time, did not have sufficient presence of mind to say, but the handshake is an embrace as well. Hand embracing a hand, a pinky embracing a pinky is also an embrace. Uh, and therefore, you can stretch this uh, metaphor in order to suggest a kind of way of being between people that stands in exact opposition to what we, or exact contrast to what we might otherwise think of uh, conflict. So let me introduce first what I'm going to say with a few comments about, uh, about conflict, about the heart of the Christian faith, and then actually, rather than talking about what comes before embrace, I want to spend some time talking about the embrace itself. Because I'm afraid that sometimes even the visions of reconciled lives uh, have been, our visions have become impoverished. And I want to stimulate us, encourage us to dream, uh, in a sense, big, even in situations of, uh, of, of sometimes intractable conflicts. We obviously live in highly polarized political situation, and that has ramification uh, for communities, for churches, for marriages, uh, for friendships, uh, and so forth. And we live also in a world, pluralistic world, in which people of different types of not just persuasions, but deep, deep convictions uh, are forced somehow or have come to live under the same roof, and there's no divorcing. <laughs> uh, you have to live together and therefore find ways in which you can, in fact, manage a situation. And often that results, obviously, in conflict. We see, for instance, that throughout the world in persecution of many uh, religious and non-religious communities, Christians, as it turns out, happen to be one of the most persecuted religion in the world. It's the largest religion, but nonetheless, there are a lot of persecuted Christians, uh, Muslims as well, and others. Um, <clears throat> that all speaks of a situation in a globalized world that is pluralistic, but we are forced to live, as I said, under the same roof. Uh, when we think about resolving conflicts, I think one of the first rule ought to be, I think I've taken that for myself uh, as one of the principal rules, is we have to work toward resolving conflicts out of our deepest convictions. We need to be true to ourselves as we are in conflict and as we try to resolve the conflict. We cannot betray ourselves in the process of conflict resolution because then there wouldn't be anybody to be reconciled. In a sense, a betrayal would have taken place. And often, 
that um, either truth, being true to ourselves or betraying ourselves, it concerns some of our kind of deep sense of, uh, of identity, substance also of the matter of what our lives are about. Often it concerns uh, religious convictions that we have. Uh, often it concerns, concerns deep moral uh, convictions that we, can, that we can. And one can put it in the sense this way, I cannot expect to be a little bit less of a Christian so that I can live with a Muslim or with a Marxist uh, together, right? Uh, and vice versa, obviously. A Muslim ought not to be a little bit less Muslim so that uh, life together with people who differ from them might uh, be acceptable. I cannot betray my convictions about, uh, about life and other issues of this sort in order to live together. Now, that complicates the matter, right? The sturdier the identity is, the more difficult it becomes to live together. And yet, I think in the pluralistic world, it is precisely uh, people who haven't been betrayed their identity that, identities that have to learn how to live well together. Now, another question that issue needs to be added, it's not just a matter of not betraying the substance of our convictions uh, for the sake of resolving uh, a conflict, uh, in resolving a conflict, or it's a, it, it, the, a betrayal would happen if we tried to do that, but also the way we go about resolving conflict bears on who we are and how we understand ourselves and relations with, uh, with people. And people are often much happier to hold on to, they're happy to hold on to the substance of their convictions, but they'll give the uh, kind of the means of relating to other people uh, easily, um, uh, consider them as simply necessary adjustment to the situation, to what situation requires. And so you would have people who sturdily stand for particular moral convictions, but they don't worry about how those moral convictions are actually implemented and achieved in social kinds of settings. Argument that I would want to make is that ends, the goals, as well as means are important. <laughs> Substantive moral decisions are being made when we talk about the means of achieving certain goals and not just when we are talking about achieving those goals. Goals and means have to be shaped, I think, I want to argue, by the substance of the Christian faith. So conflict and the way we resolve our conflict, I think, has to do with the substance of our faith. Now, let me give you a sketch of how I perceive, what I perceive the Christian faith uh, to be. It may be close to your Sunday school <laughs> definition of, of the faith, but it's important to keep that in our minds, and maybe in some point it might jar against some of our proclivities. Now, I think my deep conviction, and I think Christian deep conviction, is that God is love. And when I say that God is love, I mean to say that in order to distinguish it from the claim that God loves. It's true that God loves, but to say that God is love is a stronger statement in the sense that if God were only to love, God could also not love. <laughs> and God's love might be responsive to the particularities of situation in which God happens to find God's self. But God is love, and therefore God's love isn't a reactive love to what God finds before a God's self, but rather it is originary love so that one thing that God cannot do is not love. Now that has, once you say that, it has, if, if, if you believe that this is one of the foundational claims of, of Christian faith, it has ramifications for the entire Christian faith, and you can see easily how the entire edifice of it grows out of that very simple conviction. Not just that God is the Holy Trinity, which I think is also true, and it's tied with the connection that God is love, but also but the nature of creation. If God is love, God creates out of love, which is a different way of saying that God creates out of nothing. 
There's nothing there that God needs to improve upon so that God can love it in order to create. God creates in an originary way as a gift to the creation itself. Um, and um, sin, I think you can construe as not honoring the world as a gift, not recognizing it as a gift, not therefore giving glory to the giver, but ascribing a good deal of glory to ourselves. By the way, this idea of world, creation of the world out of God's love, out of, out of nothing, is closely tied to one of the signature virtues of the Christian faith, which we have forgotten. We kind of don't even think that it's virtue anymore, uh, or at least it's a, it's a kind of half virtue and half uh, vice. And that's the virtue of humility. It is, and it was, a signature Christian virtue that has now somehow, in a modern culture, become homeless. And that comes out of the sense of this utter gratuity of the gift of who we are um, on account of God's grace and God's creative uh, grace. Redemption is also God out of love coming uh, to the world to save the world so is also the, the, the doctrine of uh, justification of ungodly. It's justification of ungodly. Not justification of those who can make themselves nice enough. But the consequence of that is also a very uncomfortable doctrine, which is love of enemy. I think that the love of enemy is foundational to the Christian faith. If you take away the love of enemy, you have actually unchristianed the Christian faith. It can look very much like the same thing, but it ain't the same <laughs> thing. And it's for simple reason, right? Love of enemy, as you recall in, in Jesus' teaching, is motivated by imitation of the character of God who lets God's sun shine on the good and, uh, and the evil. And so you shall also be perfect as your heavenly Father, or so you shall also do as Christ, uh, Christ did. So the, the entirety you can see of the Christian faith, you can see through that lens of the love of enemy. That's not the entirety of the faith, but it is a lens through which you can see the entirety of it. This kind of originary, unconditional love lies at the heart of the Christian faith. And depending on situation, it expresses itself either in a kind of generosity, in gift giving toward others, or if you have a situation of wrongdoing, in obligation for or in enactment of forgiveness. So that giving and forgiving become two fundamental modes of human existence. That's all entailed, I believe, in the conviction that God is love. Now, consequence of this for relating to, um, in, the, in the situations of conflict, I think should be fairly obvious, but they bear spelling out. There is a kind of or consequence for living our lives in, in the world uh, also are clear, but they bear spelling out. Now, in terms of consequences of living our lives, I think... Um, Nobody put it as well, in my judgment, as succinctly as Karl Barth, who couldn't stop writing, right? Who has this interminable, <laughs> but it's amazing ability to be succinct. Um, I think he was always, uh, so um, at least when I came to visit his house, he was not, no longer living there. It was a museum in Basel. Um, he had over the works of Martin Luther, which are about 100 or so, uh, thick volumes uh, like this. He had, a, he had a sheet covering them. Uh, so, uh, and there are different interpretations about uh, why he had it, because he didn't want some ghost from Luther to jump to, to him. <laughs> but but his, his work was too close to Luther's in order for him not to, not to want that. But it may be that he was intimidated by what Luther, in his relatively short life, 
could, uh, could write, and so even very loquacious Karl Barth was uh, intimidated by much more loquacious uh, Martin Luther. But at any rate, he had this beautiful text in, in, um, in volume four of Church Dogmatics about uh, human encounter. And human encounter, being human as seeing another person truly, and being seen by another person. So the eye looking at the eye and recognizing and uh, another person, and the eye that looks, lets itself be seen at the same time, that's a fundamental element of humanity. Or uh, the ear and the tongue. It's a speech, we speak and we listen, and in the communion of speaking and listening, we enact our humanity or mutual assistance, then he said third point was of a human encounter. We render mutual assistance, not one-sided, it's mutual. I assist and I'm being assisted, so that receiving assistance is also a fundamental dimension of humanity. And finally, he said, well, you can see you do all of this in a truly human way when you rejoice while doing it. <laughs> So that the joy becomes a fundamental kind of tonality of the entire life. If you look another in the eyes and you feel that you're forced to look them in the look me in the eyes, I say sometimes to my son, <laughs> not much joy <laughs> in that looking <laughs> into, the, into the eyes, but we are properly human and truly human when that looking the other person in the eyes, when that hearing and uh, speaking, when that mutual assistant is done, assistance is done in joy. Now that's how love looks like. You can almost put in this metaphorical way, if you want, uh, in a situation outside of a concern with particular identities, maybe in a situation outside of conflict. What I want to suggest it is that something like what Karl Barth has done uh, with regard to phenomena of human encounter, if you concentrate on question of human identity, who we are as distinct from one another, one can then come up with what I have called in exclusion and embrace, book exclusion and embrace, something like drama of embrace. And in that drama of embrace, is enacted that for which we, I think, that for which we strive as we think about how to live as selves who differ from one another in a world today. So what I want to do is I want to sketch for you a little bit of that drama, what I call a drama of embrace. Now these papers have been braced each other so tightly that I can't separate them. <laughs> so obviously embrace here is a, is a metaphor, right? Metaphor of the relations between, uh, between human beings. Now what does it take to embrace? Um, well, how, do, how does one do it? <laughs> you open your arms, right? That's a kind of first moment of embrace. And these open arms in which we embrace, with which we embrace, they're kind of a sign of even tenuous, but nonetheless present of de desire for the other. I open my arms if with regard to the other person, there is some form of desire and for connection, but why is the desire here? Because I consider myself as not quite fully myself, that I am not self-sufficient in myself, but the other somehow is also and belongs to me, is part of me and belongs to me. Even a very different other in some way belongs to me. That's what I signal if I want to embrace that person. What I also do, I think, is I symbolically show that I have created space in myself where the other can come in. So it is a symbolic opening of space of the self, which says, 
oh, there, there is space here for you too. <laughs> this is not just space for me. <laughs> this is a space also for you. There's also, in some ways, a creation of a fissure, symbolically, through which the other person can come in. Obviously, I'm, um, I'm not porous, <laughs> right? I'm closed. <laughs> uh, and therefore, I have to somehow open myself for the other person, and open arms suggest just that. And I think, finally, open arms are an invitation. Here. Come. Now, the second element of embrace, you might think is closing the arms, but it isn't. Second element of embrace is waiting. If you don't wait, there isn't any embrace. If you grab, that's not quite an embrace. Movement of embrace cannot be understood, ought not to be understood, as invasion. I'm not invading you, taking you to myself, when I embrace. So waiting for the other means waiting for the desire of the other. Waiting for the agency of the desire, waiting for the similar kind of opening that's there on my part to be there on their part. And this is why and how waiting is a modality of love. Because waiting in this sense is a mode of respect for the other person. Now, it's um, for, for an impatient person like me, <laughs> It's a uh, it's hard lesson to learn that patience is a modality of love, or can properly understood patience just is that, because it honors the other's pace, the other's character, and stays with them in that process while waiting for a response to oneself. So waiting. Because nobody should be coerced or manipulated into an embrace. And kind of it, you, what you've got also with waiting is assumption that embrace entails mutuality. Right? It's not one-sided thing. You've got to have forearms, <laughs> two pairs of arms to embrace. You can do it with one pair. Right? You can embrace something, but you can't embrace someone with two pairs of arms. You've got to have four. And that's why you have to wait. Now, the third, then, element is closing one's arms. Reciprocal closing. <laughs> that is to say, again, the mutuality of the relationship is signaled by this requirement for embrace to be reciprocal. It takes two to embrace. Also, I think what's important is a kind of softness of touch. Yeah, you can't crush another person when you embrace. You've got to honor the person not just in waiting for the person to come to you, but you've got to honor the self of the person, the body of the person, as you embrace the person. Otherwise, it's something like a bear hug, or I don't know what it is, right? When you kind of squeeze the life out of them in the uh, act of some uh, fake uh, and misguided love. Now, this kind of softness of touch, I mean, again, um, embrace is a, is a matter, but softness of touch has to do also something with the way in which we see and understand another person. We often, we often think that we understand 
another person. <laughs> we, we think either that we don't understand or that we, and then we think uh, the trajectory has to be from non-understanding or inability to understand to, to understanding. And I observe, I study, I say, aha, now I get the person. And yet in personal relations, that's virtually never works like that. Maybe that's how it works with the puzzling, solving the puzzles. <laughs> but person is a mystery and not a puzzle. And there's no solution to a person. A person always remains a mystery. And so a, a kind of sense of the importance of non-understanding, of staying at the moment of realizing that I do not understand the other person, that my attempts to understand that person are really twisting that person in the categories that I have construed for myself. Now we see that, for instance, just to uh, make a little digression or to bring my meditation to the point, uh, you see it in, uh, say, Muslim-Christian relations. We think we understand, we know who the Muslims are, and then often that there's definite article there, or who at least large chunk of Muslims are. And once you have this kind of uh, image lodged in, you, in your head, um, you know what they, how they're supposed to act, and if they don't act where they're supposed to, to act, you are um, uh, kind of either surprised, you think it's an anomaly if it's good, if it's uh, really worse, then you say, well, yeah, that's where they're all tending in any case, right, or something of that sort. But you have kind of locked the other person into the position that you have imposed upon them in your own understanding. Uh, that applies, obviously, in uh, friendship relationships, in uh, marriage relationships, in all sorts of relationships uh, it applies. So this sense of tarrying for a moment in non-understanding is a condition of possibility of actually having a relationship with someone concrete rather than with your image of what that someone is. That, too, is part of the softness of the embrace. Now, the final moment in embrace is opening of the arms. Now, that's surprising to some people, too. They think that embrace is this. Well, just think of it if you just did this all the time. <laughs> How many, <laughs> you just have to ask how many seconds does it, how many seconds or minutes does an embrace last to be embraced? After how many seconds does it undo itself? Unless the arms get opened, uh, you've got to think of it in those terms, right? So structural element of an embrace is that it comes to an end. It's that arms open, which is to say that the other person and the self are released back to kind of themselves from, the, from this unity that was there for a short time being. Which is to say, differently metaphorically, embrace is not there to assimilate the other into oneself. Or being embracing the other, I, don't neither, I neither take them in, nor do I let myself be assimilated. Put differently, a proper embrace is predicated on boundary maintenance. Which takes us back to the point that I made earlier on Christian identity and resolution of conflicts. A loss of identity cannot be a means of resolution of conflict. Embrace in which you let yourself be disappeared <laughs> Uh, or the embrace in which you assimilate the, the other uh, isn't embrace. <coughs> this kind of movement that happens in embrace, right? Uh, what one suggests, rather, is that self is not a simply self-enclosed, but that other is welcome in the self. And yet, self and the other are not going to be simply fused, each is going to remain itself, 
uh, and continue interacting with, with the other. This is, uh, I think, fundamental uh, because it signals something like uh, existence of boundaries, importance of boundaries, but also certain kind of porousness of boundaries. And this has become, uh, become extremely hard for us, especially in the settings of modernity, strangely enough. It's become hard for us to maintain boundaries, but to maintain them porously. If we maintain them, then they're kind of very clear, clean, uh, nothing we think, nothing comes in. If we don't particularly, then anything goes. <laughs> so you're either a fundamentalist or relativist. And there's nothing in between, right? <laughs> uh, and you can see, obviously, it's a caricature of the society uh, as a whole, but you can see fundamentalist and relativist tendencies uh, going uh, on in various, um, various kinds, of, uh, kinds of circles. And the idea is, actually, we've got to avoid both of these. Boundary maintenance is fundamental because identities are fundamental. But if it, identities somehow ought to have a history, they have to be porous for the presence of the other. And that's why I think embrace, in many ways, signals and signif uh, signifies. Um, the space is open, the other comes in, but space is then, uh, the other is released, right? Um, sometimes I, I use, uh, I've used a metaphor, of, a metaphor of home for this kind of porous boundaries. Clearly, we lock the doors of our homes, their walls, and so forth. This is our home. Uh, uh, the edges are there where, where we have gardens, and maybe we are not so particular whether somebody encroaches on our, on our garden. We'll let all sorts of critters come across, and we don't fuss too much about that. Uh, even neighbors occasionally. But there's kind of inner sanctum, and that's kind of ours. No, but when you look at it as ours, suddenly you realize, OK, how does this how did this mindedness of my home come about? I've traveled to this country, and then I brought uh, a, a souvenir. <laughs> and then I put the souvenir onto my, uh, onto my table, right? And suddenly, there is this other world sitting <laughs> uh, in the form of this souvenir that I have bought in my home. And if you start thinking about the objects that are in your home, you buy a rug. It has been produced somewhere, right? And so if you had some connection with the folks who produced them, you suddenly have, again, the entire world has come to you through a particular object. So how is your home construed as yours? By your doors being opened and by stuff coming in and becoming yours. You've rearranged them and so forth, and they become part of who you are. That's the illustration of the porousness of the boundaries and therefore of dynamic character of, of home. Um, put differently, the, the entire metaphor of embrace, <clears throat> it suggests uh, a kind of sturdiness of identities. Right? Um, embrace means opening one's arm. But it suggests also fluidity of identities. You know what else it suggests, and which is scary when you think about it? It suggests that outcomes of our actions and encounters with the others are always underdetermined. Outcomes of our reactions are underdetermined. We never fully control any properly human outcome with any human being. We are, and this is a beautiful thing, because we can be always surprised. And often, we are so incredibly surprised, right? You meet somebody, and uh, you, you're, if you're introvert like me, you don't want to talk to them. Or if you're, <laughs> if you're introvert like me, you, you think, oh, I've agreed to go to Pittsburgh. What on earth has gotten me, <laughs> gotten into me to say yes? Uh, and then you go, and you meet people, and you come back and you think, wow, this was really very interesting. <laughs> I met this, I've learned this, uh, you know, I've said, uh, I've seen this, and so forth. Suddenly I've become a, a kind of, even as an introvert, I've become a different and enriched person. 
Uh, and I couldn't predict any of the outcomes, right? I, well, no, not any. I couldn't predict what will happen to me in encounter um, with, with other human beings. That's the beauty of it, but there's kind of a scariness. And if you think of it as interaction between uh, kind of gay-friendly and gay-unfriendly kind of groups of folks, if you think about it uh, as interaction between Muslim-friendly and Muslim-not-so-friendly, uh, groups, uh, groups of folks, and you think, you know, it's better keep keep ourselves apart uh, from from one another. Often, a kind of engagement of understanding or engagement with uh, non-understanding being part of what's going on, so that you can come properly to appreciate the other person. We leave that out because it's simply too scary. This would mean that our boundaries would no longer be firm um, and we would kind of lose a, a foothold. Then you might ask, well, how come that I'm not losing my own self if I have fluid, fluid identity? What's the, at the center of myself? Who am I? I think for me, as, for Christians, for me as a Christian, let's put it this way, to be uh, personal. For me as a Christian, the response is, is clear. I'd like to say with the Apostle Paul, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the, and the life that I now live, I live through Christ. So there's me, and there's dead me, <laughs> And there's, and there's also alive me who lives, <laughs> right? Um, I, I, could, I could give an hour lecture on, on this uh, part of Galatians 2.20. It's an amazing verse. The, the entirety of Paul's, uh, Paul's theology is expressed in that verse. But also, I think, kind of fundamental convictions of Christian, conviction of Christian identity is expressed in that verse, and that frees us up. I don't need to clutch to my existence if it is Christ who is at the center. I can let loose of the boundaries, and I sometimes feel that, um, especially in these debates about fundamentalism, but we, we think that we have to have hard boundaries because otherwise our identity goes. Uh, and I think that our identity is defined by the center and not by uh, should I say it? Tall walls. <laughs> um, not by walls, <laughs> right? Uh, but by center, that for which we as ourselves truly stand. Now, what does that have to do with conflict? I think it has to do with conflict because our conflicts are often around just these issues. Who are we? How are we to respond and relate to another person? What are the obligations of myself opening my arms? To whom? And one of the features of the Christian faith is that it's universal. Every single human being is not just a potential candidate for embrace, but actually intentional ought to be, in one way or another, intentional goal of an embrace. Waiting, too. Same universality applies. Obviously, you can't wait um, in many areas all of the time. <laughs> you have to make political decisions or something of that sort, right? Um, and we, that's why we have a debate that go around uh, issues. We make decisions, but when we make decisions, they still continue in the sen sense to be open. That is the nature of our democracies, I think. And that's why I, I tend to think that democracies aren't, tend to be in sync with kind of this entire picture that I've sketched of what Christian faith is about. You see where I'm headed with it, that a kind of nurturing of a stance of embrace 
is probably our best bet <laughs> to forestall conflict. It's, uh, in some ways, you know, my own reflection on reconciliation has happened um, as my own home country, former Yugoslavia, was undergoing um, civil war or war between independent, newly independent uh, states. And often the voice of reconciliation wouldn't be even heard. Um, you know, the book Exclusion Embrace was written, just about was published uh, immediately after the war. In Croatia, nobody wanted to read the book. <laughs> A lot of people read it in, in the States, but in Croatia, nobody wanted to read the book. And the reason for it was I was taking away their enemy. If you are in the middle of the conflict, if somebody is in the middle of the conflict, you try to take away their enemy, you become an enemy. <laughs> they love their enemies. <laughs> 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 In fact, they can't live without them. <laughs> so a kind of uh, insertion in the situation of conflict, you kind of have to wait until it cools down. But that means that preventive measures are actually not so much reconciling measure, but modalities of life that makes reconciliation superfluous. Reconciliation kicks in when life hasn't succeeded. It happens when uh, then wrongdoing has happened, right? And then we have to deal with the wrongdoing, right, so that we can get ourselves back to some form of, uh, of embrace. And it's important to keep in mind that that's exactly what reconciliation aims for, but that's exactly also what reconciliation aims for is exactly what our lives ought to be quite apart from reconciliation. In conflict situations and in pre-conflict situations, in the post-conflict situation, this kind of sense of what a life, vision of a life of embrace, in my understanding, is probably the most important thing that we could do. And by the way, it's actually very beautiful. And I sometimes think that in conflict situations, we forget. We were so tied into the conflict that we forget the vision of what truly being human can be. And the worst thing that can happen to us, to allow ourselves to lose our humanity in the process of being in conflict with somebody else. We've lost our souls, we've lost ourselves, becoming the image of our enemy. And that's why the vision of life, reconciled life, is fundamental to reconciling work. That that's why what comes before embrace is a kind of striving for embrace, <laughs> is practicing embrace. Penguins are playing still? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>